starts right now. Well, it was a long night for the San Antonio Police Department. Today, we have confirmed that SAPD responded to at least four shootings overnight. Our Avery Everett was there at at least one of those. She joins us now live after looking into how the city council's budget could help the police department during times like last night. The San Antonio Police Department will soon add more than 100 officers to its force. Now, this increase is the largest increase the department will see within the last 20 years. So let's talk about last night. What we know so far were that officers responded to at least four shootings that we've confirmed with SAPD. These shootings last night come in a month already marked with five SAPD officers shot in a span of two weeks. This scene you're seeing right now happened around 9 o'clock last night on Roosevelt Avenue in the south side. Officers shot and killed a man who Chief William McManus says was holding a knife. He was armed with a knife, a large knife. Uh, I have not seen the body cam video. Uh, witnesses reported that there was uh, a confrontation and the, the officer wound up having to use deadly force. City Council also put an emphasis on its mental health response during its budget talks. Tonight on the Nightbeat, we'll break down what this could mean for SAPD's mental health unit and the SA Corps program. Reporting live, I'm Avery Everett, KSAT 12 News. Thanks for that, Avery. A 59-year-old man was killed last night while riding a moped. This happened last night on Lock Hill Selma and Warsbach Parkway at 1.30 in the morning. Police say the man was trying to make a U-turn when he was hit by an SUV. The driver of the SUV, Paul Samaniego, was then arrested by police for DWI. Authorities say they're still investigating the crash. Well, for the first time since May, Ken Paxton is returning to his job as the Texas Attorney General. Michael Atkinson reports from Austin. The state Senate acquitted Paxton of all 16 articles of impeachment against him. Attorney General Warren Kenneth Paxton Jr. is hereby, at this moment, reinstated to office. A day that will go down in Texas history. Attorney General Ken Paxton, Texas' top law enforcement officer, was acquitted on every article of impeachment brought against him. What I'm relieved about is it won't have a chilling effect on people that run for political office. This is a trial that should have never happened. Paxton himself was not in the courtroom on Saturday to hear that historic vote. In a statement shortly after, Paxton returning to his elected office says, Now that this shameful process is over, my work to defend our constitutional rights will resume. Governor Greg Abbott also reacting to the verdict, writing in a statement, Attorney General Paxton has done an outstanding job representing Texas, especially pushing back against the Biden administration. In an unexpected closing remarks, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, who presided over the trial like a judge, condemned the House's impeachment of Paxton, saying he wants to change the Texas Constitution to raise the bar for impeachment. He also called for an audit of the money spent by the House Board of Managers to impeach Paxton. Millions of taxpayer dollars have been wasted on this impeachment. House Speaker Dade Phelan, who voted to impeach Paxton back in May, defending the House's work, describing his and other House members who voted to impeach a difficult vote to take, but not a difficult decision. And unlike others, they chose principles over politics. The Board of Managers presented overwhelming evidence that Ken Paxton is the most corrupt politician in the state of Texas at this time. And the Republicans in the Texas Senate just returned him to the office of top cop. The Senate spent some nine hours deliberating a verdict. It would have taken two thirds of the Senate to convict, but not one article of impeachment had even half of the votes acquitting Ken Paxton. The United Auto Workers strike against Ford, General Motors and Solantis has entered its third day. It's the first time that members have struck all three unionized U.S. automakers at the same time. Rob Kirkpatrick has the latest saying the union's president said this week that workers could call for additional strikes and, quote, were prepared to do whatever they had to do. We are the union! We are the union! The historic United Auto Workers strike is now in its third day, and the president of the union signaled more walkouts could be on the way. We're prepared to do whatever we have to do, so the membership is ready. The membership is fed up. We're fed up with falling behind. The union's demands include an immediate 20% raise, followed by four additional 5% raises each over the course of a four-year deal, restoring the cost of living increases, pensions, and retiree health care coverage for all hires. The union is trying to recapture benefits workers gave up more than a decade ago when the companies were on the brink of bankruptcy. We want to be able to afford to buy the cars that we build. Our members are willing to stay in for the long haul. When we came out of bankruptcy, our starting pay at Jeep was $15.78. 14 years later, it's $15.78. 
There's something wrong with that. This strike is historic because it's the first time the union has selectively targeted plants operated by the big three, Ford, GM, and Stellantis at the same time. A county commissioner in Michigan who participated in the 1970 UAW strike joined auto workers picketing outside a plant in Wayne. The difference is, is uh, everything moved and got better except the benefit in the wages for the UAW member. Negotiations are resuming with Ford and General Motors on Sunday, and the union said they had, quote, reasonably productive conversations with Ford on Saturday as both sides work toward an agreement. I'm Rob Kirkpatrick reporting. Still ahead on the news at 530, your fall flu shot appointment could now include another important vaccine. Pharmacies in San Antonio are getting the new COVID booster shots ready. We'll tell you when after the break. And the unemployment rate has gone up in San Antonio. We'll talk by how much and how we compare to the state's numbers next. Some economic news to report for San Antonio. Our unemployment rate has increased to 4.3 percent. That's according to Workforce Solutions Alamo. It's not all doom and gloom, though. We're still better than the state's unemployment rate, which is at four and a half percent. And with the growing number of people entering our labor force, Workforce Solutions says that affects the unemployment rate, too, as they wait to get jobs. We spoke to Workforce Solutions CEO Adrian Lopez, who talked about the much needed balance between economic workforce and development. Workforce is extremely key to the local economy, right, and to the national economy. Produces new jobs, um, you know, definitely has, um, you know, an impact on the overall sort of economy. September is also Workforce Development Month, so if you're looking for a job yourself, you can visit our leading essay article with the link to Workforce Solutions Alamo. And it's time to roll up those sleeves again. According to doctors, the new COVID booster shots are getting ready this week. San Antonio Metro Health reported more than 2,000 new cases this week, but numbers have dropped compared to last week. The federal government approved the new vaccine on September 11th, with the CDC issuing new recommendations for who should get them. The booster shot will target a new strain of the virus. Pharmacies in San Antonio will have them available, as well as pop-up vac pop vaccine clinics. All right, let's go outside with live cam here this Sunday evening. It was a beautiful start to the day earlier this morning in the upper 60s and low 70s in and around San Antonio. We saw a few clouds work back in this afternoon, but still plenty of sunshine and highs in the low to mid 90s. Now, as we gear up for the upcoming work week, another nice morning is expected tomorrow, but high pressure is going to take over in the days ahead, which means unfortunately those rain chances come down and nice for those afternoon highs will continue. But good news, we still don't have any triple digit days in the forecast. We'll get you all those details after the break. All right, guys, welcome back on this amazing Sunday. Weather has been uh, helping us out a little bit. Yeah, it's, I mean, I feel like we're we've been a little spoiled with such a great morning that we had. This Wasn't summer. it so Is it wonderful? ridiculous to say that we're spoiled with one nice morning? I mean, after what we've been through, I was gonna say <laughs> after the summer that we've had, I think we can definitely yes. enjoy it. Yeah, we had relatively lower humidity in place this morning. Skies cleared a little bit more through the overnight as well, which means temperatures were able to drop into the 60s and low 70s in and around the San Antonio area. Take a look at this morning's lows 69 the official morning low for us here in San Antonio over at the airport Kerrville got down to 61 earlier today of course the farther south that you went it was a little bit warmer still 70 degrees in Pleasanton but that morning low just shy of 70 here in town makes for the coolest morning that we have seen since June 7th that was over a hundred days ago so yes I hope you were able to get out there and enjoy it because it was a very nice start to the back half of the weekend. Now, as we look ahead to the upcoming work week tomorrow and into Tuesday, still somewhat of a seasonable start. Upper 60s, low 70s expected here in town. But then as we head into the middle to later portions of the week, we see a little bit more moisture work its way back in and those morning lows creep back into the low to mid 70s. So here's first thing Monday morning, stepping out for the morning commute. Once again, I think it's going to be very similar to what we saw out there earlier today. 
today. 68 in Canyon Lake, around 70 for us here in Bear County, 71 in Floresville, stretching over to Nixon. I do think we will see plenty of sunshine, especially throughout the first half of the day and into the early afternoon. 82 degrees by 10 a.m. By lunchtime, we've got a forecasted temperature around 88. And then as we do head into the peak heating time of the day by about 4 to 5 o'clock, we've got daytime highs pointed around 94. Most of us are going to stay dry, but we'll keep a 10% chance for a very stray shower to pop up before the day is done. But that's about it. So low to mid 90s will be the theme by this time tomorrow. 95 in Converse, 96 in Pleasanton, 94 in Sabinal, and 93 out west in Uvalde. I do think humidity in the afternoon tomorrow will still relatively be on the lower end. But as we mentioned earlier, especially by the middle to later portions of the upcoming work week, those winds flip in from the southeast and that's going to allow for a little bit more Gulf moisture to work its way back into south central Texas. All right, so let's talk about the setup, what we're expecting to find here in the coming days. You can see right now we don't have a whole lot going on across the Lone Star State, just a few showers out in far west Texas. But as we take a look farther off to the southwest, there's a high pressure system building in. What's going to happen over the next few days? That's going to work its way farther up to the north and the east and then move into parts of the state as well. You can see in terms of the rainfall potential, especially through Thursday and Friday, for the most part, that rain making energy is deflected around that high pressure system. So we really don't have any notable organized rain chances to talk about. Unfortunately, we'll just keep a 10% chance in the forecast, especially by Thursday, Friday. Friday and Saturday, a slightly better chance closer to the coast. Whatever we do find, again, it is going to be limited in coverage. It's not going to be drought busting, but it will tack on to what we were able to find over the past week or so. These are observed rainfall totals in case you missed it from last Saturday, which was September 9th. It wasn't for everybody, but we did have a few rounds of rain, 0.42 so far this month for us here in San Antonio. So again, with that high pressure system taking over, mainly a quiet week for us here in San Antonio. Daytime highs still in the low to mid 90s, but hey, at least no triple digits, right? So we're trending in the right direction. And I see a six there. Yes. On one of the lows. Yes. <laughs> what is happening? Tomorrow morning should be pretty similar to what we saw today. Okay. Get outside and take what? a walk. Midway through September, 90s, no yeah. triple digits. <laughs> we shouldn't be Be that excited. Be though. Better late than never. <laughs> Thanks for that, Mia. All right, Nick is in the house with us. Welcome, and man. I know it's very exciting <laughs> to have you here. Thank you, guys. We're talking NFL football today. Yeah, lots of good action out there. What can you tell us? Well, guys, the Texans are fell to 0-2 behind another rough offensive performance. We're going to hear from quarterback C.J. Stroud. Plus, we got some crazy overtime games in the NFL. We also got some statues from going to be unveiled up in Detroit. Go make sure you do not miss it. We don't go anywhere. Well, the Houston Texans came into the season knowing things were going to be a little bit different, not just a new head coach, a new quarterback, a new sense of excitement. But after getting crushed in game one against the Baltimore Ravens, not even scoring a touchdown, game two today against the Indianapolis Colts was an opportunity to get back in the saddle. Head coach D'Amico Ryans was fired up to get things going, but the former linebacker didn't want to see this from his defense. Colts QB Anthony Richardson dancing in the open field and getting in for his second rushing touchdown of the day. Richardson would leave with a, the game with a concussion later in the first half. Now the Texans trying to respond. C.J. Stroud finds Nico Collins for his first passing touchdown of his NFL career, but it would get ugly from then on in. Gardner Minshew in at quarterback. He dumps it off to Zach Moss, who reaches across the pylon for the touchdown. The Texans will make it close to the second half, but it wasn't enough as Houston drops to 0-2 on the season, losing 31-20. to I'm trying to fight my tail off just to be able to play because uh, uh, my shoulder was hurting me, but um, at the end of the day, uh, I wanted to be out there for my guys. I wanted to play, um, and um, I had a little pain here and there, and, but I mean, at the end of the day, I just wanted to play because uh, I had the opportunity from God, man, just um, to be in the in a great city like Houston, I wanted to play in the home opener and, and uh, try to flip this thing around the right way. 
Well, the Dallas Cowboys defensive coordinator Dan Quinn and his guys were trying to stay loose at practice this week ahead of their showdown against the New York Jets. After a dominant shutout performance over the New York Giants in week one, you could feel a little sense of excitement at the defense and what they could do against Aaron Rodgers and the Jets offense. But then Rodgers tore his Achilles just four plays into game one and things got a little sad in the sports world. When some of the defensive backs were asked about how they feel about not getting a chance to play against Aaron Rodgers, they were disappointed but focused on getting a week two win. I mean, you never want to see nobody go down. You know, we put so much into this game. You know, to see someone go down first week, it's tough to swallow. Um, but, you know, you just got to take the situation how it is and, you know, prepare for whoever out there. We're going in to win a football game as the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, we can care less who's the quarterback. Like I said, uh, unfortunate what happened to Aaron. But uh, we're going in to win a game. It doesn't really matter who lines up, you know, home or away. You know, we're going in to win a football game for the Dallas Cowboys, and that's all that matters to us. Well, due to TV rights, we can't show you the highlights until this game is over. But right now, the Cowboys are up 27 to 10. We're going to have full team coverage from Jerry's World with Larry and Mary tonight on Instant Replay. So make sure you do not miss it. Let's check out some other games from this afternoon. The Kansas City Chiefs back to full strength with tight end Travis Kelsey and defensive tackle Chris Jones with the sack back in action. Now, just before halftime, Patrick Mahomes finds Sky Moore for his first touchdown of the season and more. Couldn't be more happy than on the other side of the break. Mahomes finding his main man, Travis Kelsey, in the end zone as the Chiefs would go on to win it 17 to 9. Up in Detroit, the unveiling of Barry Sanders' statue was held this weekend. Uh, the Hall of Famer seemed to have uh, liked it, uh, but nobody, nobody wanted to see. All right, we're going to go straight to the Ravens versus the Bengals. A huge matchup between two premier quarterbacks. And jump into the third quarter. This is Lamar Jackson, and he's going to be taking on Joe Burrow and the Bengals. Jump to the third quarter. Burrow finds T. Higgins, who snags the touchdown to make it a one possession game. So Lamar Jackson said, OK, let me show you what I can do. Placing it perfectly for Nelson Aguilar, who goes ahead and does a dance of his own. The Bengals need to stop, need a stop to get the ball back, but the Ravens just run them over and hold on to win it 27 to 24. Well, the eyes of Texas were upon the Longhorns last night. Everyone waiting to see if that big win against Alabama in week one was the real deal or just a flash in the pan. And one of the things that was evident last night was the slow start from the Longhorns altogether. The defense letting up a 62 yard rushing touchdown to start the game. And it wasn't until the fourth quarter where the Longhorns scored three straight touchdowns. Head coach Steve Sarkeesian said that the fourth quarter isn't something that they can always hang their hats on. You, you can't rely on that. You know, we got to make sure that we don't lose um, our stinger of being a great first half football team, which we've been historically over the first two seasons, is that we're really dialed into the game plan and guys go executed at a high level. And so I want to make sure we get back to that uh, because that that was definitely strength of ours. You know, ultimately, you know, that's that's coaching, right? We got to come in here on Monday morning and we got to point out areas where we can improve initially and, and make sure that our psyche is right and that we're dangerous from from the opening kick and not waiting till we got to have it moments. I mean, we, we got to have it once that ball's kicked off in the first quarter. And there's a lot of fun being had in Austin with the way that the Longhorns are looking like they might be national championship Ooh. contenders. Yes, I, I just said you that. said it. I didn't. But Music I mean, music to her ear. I'm <laughs> feeling it. Haters are going to hate. You know, are you, are you yes, going to say are. the phrase Texas is I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. Texas is, that was close. I'm, I'm not going to say it. It starts with a B-A-C. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not jinxing anything. I love them. But anyway, thank you, Nick, so much. You're and, welcome. Uh, we'll Thanks be right back. <laughs> All right, check this out. The painting from Bob Ross's first TV episode is listed for sale for about $10 million. A Minnesota-based gallery is selling the original oil painting called A Walk in the Woods. It has Ross's signature in the bottom left corner. And get this, it was painted live on air in January of 1983. In the Joy of Painting show, the current owner says he bought it in the and earlier this year from a PBS volunteer who was there during the time of the filming 
Mia, you think you can paint something for us right now? <laughs> Nothing to that caliber. But there is something so calming about Bob Ross I right? love and his paintings. All right, quick check at our evening forecast. Falling through the 80s, temperatures eventually into the upper 70s. And then pretty quiet this week, guys. All right, thank you so much. That's all our time for now. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see y'all at 10.